Hey, hello, everybody. How is everybody doing? The signal is fantastic. I feel like Anna in the tropics. I don't know if you remember that play, but I saw that on Broadway with the great Jimmy Smiths. I don't want to drop names. And I seldom meet famous people. I don't have that kind of uh, luck. I, I, I'm sure if you know who I am, you know that I'm the woman who went viral for going nuts over Ricky Martin. I never met him in person, haven't met him in person, adore him, respect him, admire him, but I only met him via satellite and I couldn't see him. That's the kind of luck I have. So if you invite me to meet somebody per, uh, famous, just know we're not going to meet him. I'm a jinx to all of it. But Jimmy Smith, I had the honor to interview and also go see him uh, Anna and the Tropics, a beautiful play uh, based in Cuba, and it was gorgeous. And Jimmy Smith was the sweetest, the nicest, gave me a big hug. O sea, me enamore. Me enamore del Jimmy Smith. And I will always have that memory of him. Antonio Banderas was so nice. You know, those actors that when you tell them your acting was fantastic, they'll go, really? Oh, I'm so glad you liked it. You're like, why would you care? Si yo soy una sangana. No, they, it was just fantastic, their reaction. And Jimmy Smith had that reaction when I told him his acting on stage was fantastic. And Antonio Banderas did too. And then I met Javier Bardem and I also went like, blah, blah, blah. See, I should count my blessings and not whine on this Wednesday wine because I name dropped three people right there that a lot of people don't get to meet in person. Así que cállate, Belaval. Own it. All right? Own it. Salud. Cheers. Today is not wine because I got, I'm warm. Chicago is lovely. We're live from the Midwest. And I'm having a little cocktail because my friend Swery Mary uh, recommended from Trader Joe's, which actually my guest adores Trader Joe's, this juice that is watermelon cucumber. And she said, try it with a splash of rum. I didn't like it with rum, so today we're doing it with vodka in honor of Swery Mary with a little bit of ice. Salud, like a boyfriend I used to have used to say, que sea un motivo, just toast to whatever you want. Mm. It's nice to see all of you, Jessica, Debbie, hi, Todd, Patty, TJ, wonderful to see you. I hope your week is going well. Thanks for joining me again. So the point of Ana in the tropics, look how tropical my my flowers are. I went to my favorite florist, which is my local florist. And I said, I need something tropical. And in lieu of birds of paradise, she gave me kind of this. And I know that my guest is going to love it because she's like a tropical storm, this girlfriend of mine. And one of those people that I have seldom seen in person, but I feel so close to because our life philosophy, our professional philosophy, our personal philosophy is very similar, which is interesting because we were both raised, her in Chicago, me in Puerto Rico, but by very similar moms. And um, we clicked. And she has been holding my hand on my YouTube channel through the process of me learning how to make authentic Puerto Rican food. And that's kind of how I found her because during the quarantine, she decided to put down in writing what her mom had taught her and shared it with the world. world. And that's not strange because Rebecca Nieves Hoffman has lived her life being true to herself. I'm not sure how long it took her or if she was raised to live her culture to the fullest. And sometimes that can prove really difficult when you're going to be the first in your family to do many things, including going to college, which is what Rebecca did. So Rebecca's passion besides cooking Puerto Rican food, besides her beautiful family and her career has been to mentor those kids. You don't necessarily have to be Latino. This can happen in a lot of immigrant families. Uh, those or multi-generational generational families, those kids that are the first to go to college. When I got here to Chicago, you know, I have the blessing and the privilege to come from uh, parents that were college educated. And I thought, stupid me, privileged to me, that everyone was going to go to college who wanted to go to college, right? That it was standard operating procedure. You went to high school, you went to college. That's what we did uh, where I grew up. And then when I got here, it broke my heart. So many kids after high school don't even think that's a possibility. Forget the money, 
forget the chances. It's just that they don't have the path to get there. And once they get there, especially for Latinos and Latinas, the rate of dropout is significant because they feel lost. And I'm going to tell you something, no matter my privilege, no matter the fact that my parents were college educated, when I came to the to college in the United States, I gravitated to the Latino group of friends. Because even though I spoke the language and even though I had been here, the vacaciones, I felt lost. I didn't know my place, right? So my dear friend has dedicated her career to do that. And today she joins us with some great tips. And I'm gonna tell you something. She sent me this. This not only applies to college students, but it applies to adults too, who, who are the only or the first in the boardroom, in the company, uh, CEOs, the first manager of a restaurant. When you have to be the first, when you have to be a pioneer, these tips are for you. So let me introduce to you my friend, Rebecca Nieves Hoffman. Hello. Hello, Bella. How are you? I'm doing great, Bella. You look beautiful. Well, thank you. You know, I'm going to talk to Ana Bella, but I better come correct. You flatter me, honestly, when you're like, are you going to make me cry? You really want me to do Wednesday wine? No, 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 no. Any kind of cry. I was like, Nena, you're going to make me ugly cry right now. Okay. Because okay. I've been admiring you from a distance and then the little pockets of, it was so funny the other day when I found that picture yes. right after I saw In the Heights, I was looking for pictures of when I saw In the Heights in, mm -hmm. you know, in Hermosa and at the Miracle and Center. the Miracle Center. Mm -hmm. And then boom, there's a picture with you and me taking a selfie. And I'm like, ay, que linda. <laughs> I know, it was meant to be, it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I love that not only has your professional career taken you through the path of education and access for all, but also that you realize the importance of continuing that guidance and that mentorship. Did you get that kind of mentoring or did this come about because you felt lost? Both. So as mm. far as mentoring, Mary Santana, who is the executive director and founder of the- Santa Mary. Mary. Santa She's Mary. Like, I'm La Santa Maria. Woo. Okay. Um, but she was my very first like official mentor. And we went to church together and she really took me under her wing and- encouraged me and gave me a lot of spiritual mentorship. But when it came to like mentoring around the college process, um, careers, nena, yo estaba on my own, completely on my own. And my family, while they tried doing what they could, you know, um, they hadn't gone through that process or path. So I really just, uh, wherever the doors would open, I would kick them down and bum rush in and see what, you know, would come out of it, you know, um, it's so funny when I think about the opportunities that came my way that I'm like, I don't know how to do that or I don't know anybody in that, but I'm like, okay, I'll do it, you know? And yeah. I think that's really has served me well that even though it could feel scary and it feels like, ooh, you just learn by doing. That's like the best professional development you can get is just by learning by doing. Yep, it's, the, it's that idea of improv of yes and. You don't yep. say no, you, you say yes and, and you figure it out in the process. Not to say that you don't educate yourself and prepare yourself for right. the challenge, but right. saying yes is so, so important. What do you think is the number one, and I don't wanna say mistake, but the, the first problem these kids encounter when they're first generation and they get to college? It's fear. I mean, it's the number one thing. It's fear of failure. It's fear of disappointing your parents that you know have worked so hard and sacrificed so much to come to this country, whether you're an immigrant or a migrant, because for us Puerto Ricans, we migrate to this country. Yeah. Um, and so you know, I think it's fear of failure and fear of disappointing your family. And one of the, and, and, and I know we're not here to talk about in the Heights, but I so related to Nina's character. You know, I was, I was thinking daughter. about that. I was just thinking oh. about that. I, yo me estaba bebiendo las lágrimas. I was I bet you were. sitting there crying, looking at Nina's story because she felt the weight of the pressure of her community on her shoulders, you know? And did you notice how when there were certain scenes where she was talking about her struggle and then esa nenita was watching her, the oh. little girl was watching her. Mm -hmm. And I just, I always felt that way growing up in the church and my community that 
I had this responsibility that since I knew that I needed to go out and get an education and to create a different trajectory for my family, um, mm -hmm. that I had my community not just uh, you know watching me but supporting me and cheering me on. And yeah. so um, you know, but Nina's character, man, in that and that felt. Ah, I, I, it was amazing. I loved it. And, 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 you know, I totally understood her. I, I hadn't felt that way, but I have enough friends that have, and I understand right. that idea of you don't, you don't know what I'm talking about because you weren't there. And it has kind of happened with my career because no one in my family belongs to the world I belong to. So there are things I tried to explain to my mom and dad that they're like, well, why wouldn't you get the job? Well, because, you know, this yeah. is a fickle industry or I, you know, they, they don't like the way I look or they don't like the way I sound or there's there's this hierarchy that is not the one in corporate America where my dad worked or my mom was a teacher. So mm -hmm. it, you feel that disconnect and that's why mentors are so important. So critically important. And, you know, that's, that's one thing that... Um, I always advise young people because um, in the organizations that I've worked in before, particularly the most recent one, City Year, where there's hundreds of young people that are serving, doing service for a year, um, taking a year off. I was like, you need to get yourself a mentor. And it's not one of these things that, that you just walk up to some random person you admire and say, can you be my mentor? These things are relationships that are organic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. Mary and I, we immediately gravitated towards each other. I admired her. She saw potential in me and we just clicked. And it wasn't until maybe like a year later that I heard her say, oh, this is my mentee. And I'm like, oh, mira, oh. you know, like mira, she's my mentor officially, you know? So uh, that's one of the things that I, I advise uh, young people is like, don't think that, you know, by going by someone random that you have no established connection to that you, you should just go up and say, will you be my mentor? It kind of reminds me of that no. Dr. Seuss book of, are you my mommy? Uh, are you my mommy? <laughs> <laughs> but it has to be organic. Yeah. And, it, and it has to be, you have to have a relationship because my issue with some of these mentoring programs is that what if I don't have a connection with the mentee? I, I The people who consider me, their mentor, and I don't know how many they are, are people who know they can reach out, that I don't have a lot of time, and that they have to ask the questions fast, and that they have to, you know, I can, I will answer in the way that I can and when I can, but I'm going to be there for them, and we have to have that relationship. It can't be somebody that once a week I see, let's talk. No, it has, to, I don't have time to create a syllabus for the mentoring program. I don't, yeah. Yeah, no. And I my mentors didn't either. My mentors, my mentor was, Lori Montenegro, who was my intern boss at Univision. Nice. And, and, uh, and my, my other mentor was my boss here, Jorge Ra Berta Castañer. And Jorge Ramos was my mentor at Univision. He doesn't even know it because all I did was pay attention to what he told me. That's right. That's right. And whenever I needed him, he would be there. These three people that I've mentioned, when I pick up the phone to make a decision, especially Berta and Lori to this day to make a professional decision, they're there. That's awesome. And it's, and you yeah. know, these are relationships that are lifetime, right? And and they grow mm -hmm. with you. And then the next thing you know, you're spending, you're breaking bread with each other constantly. You're, yeah. you know, uh, helping on not just professional, but personal decisions that are in your life, you yeah. know, and a lot of times those intertwine. And this is one of the things that, you know, as far as the five tips I wanted to share today is mm -hmm. like, you know, these are things that are not just professional in education, but they're also in your personal life. They totally life. marry each other, you know, and, and they com complement each other. So, yeah. Especially if you are looking for a different life than the one that you grew up with. Yes. I think. Absolutely. Right? That's right. So the okay. first thing I wanted to share with folks that I okay. tell oh, but pardon. I, did I interrupt? Ooh, dale. Okay. Dale. Dale. How to be the, yes. We're, we're calling this how to be the first. I love it. And so this is the first to go to college, graduate, first to start a business. Oh my God, entrepreneurship, that's its own, but it's being the first, you know? Um, it's applicable to all the things that you mentioned earlier. So the first thing I would I advise people as far as tips is you gotta be careful how you spend your time, particularly and especially during the summers. <laughs> if you're first in your family to go to college or graduate from college, or hopefully graduate from college, is, um, and this is aprendizaje or learnings that I've had, um, you know, ojo, what does mommy always say, ojo? You know, presta atención. Um, 
is you got to be careful how you spend your time during the summer. Um, so a lot of times people take that time off, take a break. There are no breaks when you're on a path to blaze a trail that's never been blazed before. You need to engage in activity like having an internship that's aligned with your interests, um, putting yourself in a situation where you're shadowing people that are industries that you wanna possibly get into. Internships are the number one way to avoid majoring in a subject that later on you get that degree and you say, mm, this is not what I wanna do. I mean, Agreed. how many- how many people do we know, Anna, that majored in something and then once they got into their career, they're like, ah, this is not for me. It happens with attorneys all the time. Oh, my God. And tanto dinero y tanta vaina, como dicen los de dominicanos, pa qué? You know? Okay. Um, it so happens with attorneys all the time. Yeah. So internships are kind of like a way to date the profession before fully committing to it with a degree, you know? I love it. And so... um. One and and you know, a little pro tip, if you will, when you're a parent as well, like this is what I'm doing with my kids too, is mm -hmm. trying to expose them. They're not at this age yet, but I'm thinking and planning for this. But you know, what professions do they want to be in? Okay, fine. I observe because you know, I'm a member of a country club. Yes, I am. <laughs> That's another thing. It's like yes, I own it. I'm a member of a country club. Yes, I, go ahead I, and I, go, I, go ahead and check her Instagram. Because they're going to kick her out of that country club soon. They're going to kick me out of the club. I go in they're there doing como bolsa. <laughs> But, you know, golf caddying, let me tell you something. Oh, my God. Golf caddying. Listen. Listen, I my white friends know where it's at. You don't know how many people I know who have been successful, especially my Americano friends, especially yeah. my white Americano friends who yes. caddied. Yes. And now so, are super successful. So what happens when people of privilege in these country clubs golf? They broker deals. They mm -hmm. talk about challenges that they're going through in the workplace. They talk about stuff that's about to happen before it hits the news. ¿Y qué está haciendo los caddies? Ojo, como dice Ojo México. Ojo al bochinche. Ojo yes. y oído al bochinche. But another thing that makes first generation anyone uncomfortable is not knowing the jargon and the language that people use in professions. No better way for you. Being a golf caddy is like being a fly on the wall. You know what I mean? And you get insights to professions and conversations that otherwise you would have never gotten. So guess what? Sophia's not into golfing that much. Pero tú sabes qué? Even though she doesn't like sweating and all that stuff, I bet you next year in the summer, she's going to be a golf caddy. And guess what, people? Mi gente, you can start golf caddy caddying um, by the age of 12 and make big money. In the golf club that's close to here that Obama is a member of, <laughs> he's not, not the golf club I'm a member of. Unfortunately. I haven't made it to that part, part yet. And when he does come by, I'll probably be in the bushes like, you know, no, I'm joking. I won't. But, um, you know, they they start them off early at 12, 13 years old. And so, you know, this is another thing as far as stuff that's not familiar to us. So if you're in the Latinx community or just the first gen immigrant community and you have someone in your family that talks about, I'm going to learn how to pay golf, support them in that. <laughs> you know, like, don't say, I bet that who got otro deporte that we can go cheer you on or whatever. Like sometimes family could be your biggest cheerleader. But sometimes because of the lack of exposure and understanding the certain things, they can be an impediment, right? So, I mean, it just is what it is. And so bottom line is spend your summers and your time intentionally and <laughs> get those kids to be golf caddies. And also you were going like this. You know how much money these kids earn in tips? In tips. I mean, oh, I mean, my husband tells me when he goes golfing with three of his buddies, each of them leave like 50 bucks each for the golf caddies. That's 200 bucks that they make in four hours or whatever. We're giving them the stick. For yes. We're the giving the ball or lo que sea. Eso todo, you know? So, so anyways, spend your time wisely, especially during okay. the summer. That's All the right. First. Somebody, I love this because somebody here had asked about student loans and your next tip says not all debt is bad debt. I, uh, yourself. Okay, so this is one thing that's so heartbreaking to me is that, yes, one thing about the immigrant community is that we are savers. We are, you know, like my fam my father, like after he died, we found out that there were all these little bank accounts everywhere because Papi was like a squirrel. He put money a little bit <laughs> everywhere, you know? And um, 
So we have this impression. And when kids in our community go off to college and they talk about taking out loans, no, no, eso es malo. Be come home, go to community college and it's cheaper. And, um, and, 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 and don't, don't do that. Don't take out a loan, but there are different kinds of student loans out there and they have deadlines. So mi gente que le gusta to procrastinate, we need to be on the ball with those deadlines and applying on time for those grants, but particularly with those loans. Now, if student loans have been historically ones that are, are lower interest, unless you're going with like an independent bank that's trying to, you know, loan shark you on some sometimes. So you have to be wise about what kind of loans you get, but not all debt like student loans. Student loans is an investment in your future, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, now with, with college being so expensive to finance, um, it's just re it's mandating for parents and kids to be even extra intentional about how they're going to finance it. Is it going to be through grants, through through loans, whatever? But don't I, I just always advise Latinx parents in particular, don't make a rash decision on your kids education of pulling them out of an educational institution and putting them in another one because you want to do get education on the cheap. You know, like that's. That's now there are certain circumstances. Everything is is you know, yeah. relative to the home life situation where that's mandated. You you have no choice and you have to do that. But if you have a choice, please don't look at student loan debt all with a blanket decision that it's all bad debt. It's it's not bad. See, but here's the thing. I don't want to disagree with you, right? But especially since I have a lot of kids that are about to go to college. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um. I I have friends that tell the kids the sky's the limit. Apply wherever you want. Then the kid comes back with a sixty thousand dollar tuition every year to NYU that doesn't offer any financial aid. The parents both make decent living, can't afford sixty thousand dollars. The kid is disappointed, or the parents are broke. I didn't go to an Ivy League and I did pretty well for myself. My right. mom and dad put a cap on it and said, oh, yeah, I went to school in 92 to 96. My mom and dad said, this is how much we can pay for four years. Find mm -hmm. a university that can afford you, that we can afford. Right. Porque como dijiste tú, no podemos más arriba del, oh. Right. Because my parents could afford my education. They couldn't afford Harvard. I wasn't Harvard material. I wasn't Northwestern material. They could afford a decent education at a university in the United States that was within their means. I see my friends struggle so much. Ay, porque la nena, her dream is to be a film director. Well, she can be, you could go to Columbia College and figure out how to pay that. That's right. I have a lot of great graduates from Columbia College. It doesn't have to be NYU. So I'm afraid that by saying grab, leave them in the place that they are, don't switch them. It's like a they're going to end up struggling and then staying at the university when dad can't make the tuition payment where you need six jobs in order to eat is right. kind of hard for them when they could find an alternative. For sure. No, you're absolutely right, which is why I said it all depends on the individual situation, mm -hmm. right? If you are like your parents did it the right way, they gave you a cap. They said, mm -hmm. this is what we got to work with. And, you know, sometimes parents, we want to give everything to our kids, you know, and we don't consider the fact that we're going to in the process. But, <laughs> but, you know, here, here's the thing. I'm talking about situations where I had a prima went to Walter Co Payton College Prep, AP uh -huh. courses, GPA of a 4.3. Um, and her dad was telling her to go to a community college. And I'm like, Papito, why are you telling her that? Like, she's got she the potential to. to go. She ended up, uh, was able to go to Ivy League as well as liberal arts, you know, middle of the ground. Mm -hmm. And also community college. And I went to community college. So it's not like I keep on mentioning uh -huh. community college is a bad thing. It is mm -hmm. a great resource and an option mm -hmm. for many. But when you have that kind of potential and opportunity as far as grades, uh, GPA, yeah. hospitals, you know, grit. Don't, you know, she didn't end up going to Harvard, even though she could have gone. She ended up going to Agnes Scott in Atlanta, Georgia, which is an all girls fee, uh, uh, college, uh, not a, a 
it was an all girls liberal arts school, you know, and so middle of the ground, perfect for her, you know. Uh -huh. So, you know, it, it, parents do have <laughs> a lot of negotiations to do with their kids, considering also their finances, too. Right. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Love debt. <laughs> not all debt is bad debt. No, because it is an investment, it is your education. It's, you know, you, and there are ways and you have to inform yourself because there's a lot of wasted money that people don't tap into. That's right. And, and, and when you're talking about also entrepreneurship, because my husband's yeah. an entrepreneur, I've been able to experience the journey alongside with yeah. him is also, if you're trying to start a business and be the first to start a business, there's also, again, this immigrant mindset of like, Oh, that's that is bad. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes very interesting financial vehicles that people can produce, but you got to put yourself in a position to learn and educate yourself about those different options. So, yeah. A free or near to free college is the best school, especially for undergrad. Yep. Absolutely. I love this. Parents should save in 529. I know not all can save. We're teaching our kids six and four. What, that we have to think about where we spend our money. I'm grateful to be able to save for college now. Oh yeah, Juan, absolutely. We have, actually, we have one for our daughter, Pero El Pobre, the second one, because he's the second one, doesn't have one yet. But we we believe in those too. Yeah, no, Juan, I'm glad you mentioned that because both my kids have that. And that's, that's another point that's really important. You gotta save, as parents, we have that responsibility. We gotta save for that for our kids. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I love this one. Choose your relationships wisely. Amen. What did mommy say all the time? Dime con quien andas. Y te diré quien eres. So um, I always. Oh, I'm, my God. We sound so old. Our daughters would go. Roll the eyes. Yes. You're the eye rolling. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's really important. We talked about this earlier. Mentors are key in your journey to college and career success. Um, but. I honestly have to say that one of the most important relationships that any person will ever have, whether you're the first or not, is who you're partnered with in life. Aside from your job, who are you spending the most time with? Your spouse, your partner in life. And this is something, and, I, and, and maybe it's, it's really top of mind for me because I have a couple of mentees that are dealing with this. I don't know what it is with professional, successful Latinas in their 20s and early 30s that they think they can fix him. They think that they can fix them. And I'm just like, listen, honey, whatever it is that's bothering you about this person right now, it's gonna bother you more. Ooh, multiply that by a million. And once you're living with them, married to them, whatever, the best, you know, like it's just terrible, you know? So, um, you know, that's, that's the relationship that I feel alongside with mentors that is so critically important. Who is going to be the person, your ride or die, right next to your side, and cheering you on, like making you see things about yourself that you didn't even see were possible in yourself. You know, like when those opportunities come up and you're like, mm, should I, should I? Yes, absolutely. Like you got to have your cheerleader there. And if the person that you're partnered or dating or whatever is not doing that for you, next, you know, or just, you know, spend your time other way. <laughs> How old were you when you got married? I was 27, girl. That was old for, for my standard. You were 27? Stop! <laughs> I was crazy. 27. I had a high school boyfriend that I was going to marry. And, but that was always in the back of my head that I wanted a career. And so I did not marry until I was 27. I dated plenty. I thought I was going to marry each and every one of them. And like you said, there was something, something that I knew I couldn't live with and I wasn't going to change. That's right. And I met my husband in 27 and I made very clear that I was following my career. And if he couldn't handle it, because I come from a community of people who can't handle successful women, he needed to move on. That's and right. Knock on wood, this December, it's going to be 20 years where he's been my number one cheerleader. I sometimes I'm like, Nene, when are you going to say no? Like, when are you going to say no? You can't go to uh, that audition. No, you can't start a YouTube channel. No, wow. you can't hire a digital manager. No, you can't. But my, and I know that I got bad looks the one time I did this, but I had a group of young Latinx kids in a room once. Uh -huh. And uh I told them not to marry the boyfriend they had right now and not to get pregnant. 
That's good advice though. And that's so motherly. I love it. <laughs> and I wasn't even a mom. I remember, well, no, I was a mom. I had had Amelia. I waited seven years to have kids. I didn't think I wanted kids because I wanted a career so badly. Oh. And eventually at age 32, I decided that I wanted to have children. And it's yeah. the best thing I've ever done, but it's because of when I did it too. Right. Because because I think, and it happens in our community a lot. We love babies. We love grandchildren. We love the, but it, but that is all a fallacy. It is super hard. It is hard to go to college with a kid in tow. It is hard to, and it's not necessary. There are condoms, there are pills, there are, you know, there is abstinence. Like my mother said, there's other ways than that is not penetration. My mother was really graphic like that. You know, like. Mami, 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 mira. Cierra la pierna. Cierra la pierna. It drives me nuts. Oh, but he's so yeah. wonderful. You're 20 and you want to be a news anchor. You think with a kid and a husband. No. You're going to, he's going to want to move to six more states. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, and we fantasize. Ay, perdón, perdón. No, no, está bien, está bien, nena. No, you're, it's absolutely true. And we fantasize about what relationships and marriages should be like. And it doesn't help that Hollywood and Disney movies and all that fantasize it for us too. You know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. relationships, relationships are hard. Having kids are even hard. It's even mm -hmm. harder. And mommy is so funny. One time she told me, she goes, if I would have known how hard it is being a parent, I wouldn't have had you guys. I'm like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> But you know what? She's telling the truth and shaming the devil. She's normalizing having those feelings and those reflections. And it's the truth. And so that was great advice you gave them. But yes, choose your relationships wisely, people. And you yeah. know what? There's also this religious aspect too, right? Mm -hmm. For those of us that are Hispanic, super mm -hmm. Catholic, Christian, whatever religion you are, Jewish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you also think you we get advice from all places, right? From El pastor, the youth pastor, yep. and whatever. And sometimes their advice is just not for you. And you just have to know when it's conflicting with what your goals and your passions are, then mm -hmm. you know, you gotta seek some other relationships that are gonna support you on your journey. Absolutely, absolutely. That's super important. Um, because because you are gonna put enough obstacles in front of yourself, and life yeah. is gonna put enough obstacles in front of you. That's right, that's right. I love this. Never forget or be ashamed of where you came from. Like most Puerto Ricans don't have an issue with that. Because I know five you seconds know. into a conversation, we say we're Puerto Rican. That's right. That's right. So it's so funny when you were talking earlier in the introduction before I came on, you're like, I don't know if she grew up like this as far as her mm -hmm. cultural authenticity. My father, God rest his soul, was the person who anytime he was watching sports, a TV program in casual conversation, somebody famous would come up and he would tell everybody, you know, that person's Puerto Rican, right? They're Puerto Rican. And he was, like, your father. he was like the Wikipedia of Puerto Ricans. You would never guess are Puerto Ricans, you know, like. My mother-in-law did that with Jews and she would call it the Jew who, because she knew or anyone who was Jewish. That was famous. My mother-in-law would be like, you know, he's Jewish. You know, her mother's Jewish. You know, her father's Jewish. So, you we know, when, you, when you're little and you see that, you see that pride and that orgullo. And here's the thing. And this is why, again, I related to Nina's character and in the Heights is that you could see the internal creative tension she had of like, you know, being authentic and true to who she was. Did you notice when she came from Stanford the first day she had her hair straight and then throughout straight. the rest of the movie, it was curly. She curly. was being authentic, embracing mm -hmm. all that stuff. So there were just like little implicit messages, but the bottom line is there are things about our upbringing that have been a part of our education as a people, you know, and it's stuff that the Ivy League kids of privilege never got. And so I always say to my mentees, you've got a competitive edge against mm -hmm. those other people. You're more gritty, you're resilient, you mm -hmm. bounce back um, and embrace that. You know, if you grew up in the hood and you constantly had to walk around knowing what time to walk and what time not to be out and taking the bus and the train mm -hmm. and having situational awareness, what is that called? Managing and assessing risk. That's very important in the career world. You know, mommy used to always, uh, if there was like a cut on a fabric or a stain or whatever, 
Ah, to make it, you gotta give me a discount, please, because you know, mm -hmm. give me 25% off. And I'm like, watching this negotiating education that's negotiation. So, there's things mm -hmm. that happen in first generation households that are a part of our education that are not seen in the formal education world. But little do we know, as a people, we've been here in a different setting in a different format. We know this, it sounds familiar. To I can apply this in my career and in my profession. So, You're so smart. You're so smart. But it's all about, uh, you know, celebrating who we are. Why is it that we have to be proud of our food and our dance? We're more than that. Like, no, don't get me wrong. We're the best yeah. in that. Like food and dance and all that. Like we're the best. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but there's so many other things about us that we bring to our profession and it's because of who we are as a people it's not by accident and so this is what i tell people that are the first is like don't think because they got that hoity-toity ivy league no don't get me wrong i wish i would have gone to an ivy league school but now i got i i went to columbia college and i got it for cheaper and i turned out okay so yeah, more than okay Right, right. So yeah, don't forget where you came from, celebrate it. It's part of your education. And it allows you, for those of us who grow up bilingually and bicultural, to know how to navigate two cultures, to understand that there is more than one way to do things. That's what I tell my children about being yeah. bilingual. Since you were little, you knew that there were two ways to say things. Just like in life, when you have problems, there's more than one way to solve it or more than one way to see it. And being bicultural, bilingual, being an immigrant gives you that outsider's perspective that maybe if you were always stuck in your same town you don't have y por eso te desespera when you have to make certain um certain decisions i almost cried with this one last but not least you are your ancestors wildest dreams be centered in that purpose that's right you know there are some times that whether it's my husband going through a really tough situation my husband's black okay so when you think about his ancestors and what they had to go through my ancestors the weight on his shoulder is 10 times heavier oh my god and the fact that you know um whenever he goes through certain so you know again this goes back to the point of who choose your partner wisely I learned so much from my husband and his journey. And if he said something one time that I was blown away and it goes to this point is my biggest, my, my biggest problem right now is my ancestors answer to prayer. You know, like they prayed for us to be in these rooms and tables of decisions. They prayed for us to have these opportunities. They prayed for me to have this problem of I've got these two investor capitals, uh, capital partners that want to invest with in me. One is trying to jip me. The other one is blah, blah, blah. Which one do I go with? That is an answer to our ancestors' prayers. And so when we think about who we are as a people and what we've achieved, so, like we're enough right now. But if we were to just internalize that, that perspective and that purpose, my God, like the sky truly is the limit of what we're able to do and accomplish. And so they're carrying you and they're going to be proud of you. And like you said, you've already have achieved. Like my grandma was not allowed to be a doctor and, you know, it had to do with a master's degree in science. And then, you know, my mom said, if I would have grown in the decades that you grew, if I had the opportunities that you've had, yeah. do it, just do it all. And, and that's the kind of support you have to find. Even if you don't find it at home, find those mentors. Find those people that are going to believe in you and trust your dream and want to encourage it. That's uh, right. It's been a wonderful conversation, but I want to go back to some of the, the comments from uh, yeah. Sanford. Todd, Todd has been very active. Todd, Santiago de Rios, do you guys recommend Truman College here in Chicago? Our 18-year-old just graduated high school and can't yet figure out where to go to university or college. Listen, I always advise in that situation, yes and amen. Yes. Go to a two-year college um, you know, it, 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 you got to do those first two years, the general education requirements, whether you're in a four year college or two. So you might as well get them done, save the money and then transfer those credits or that degree, that associate's degree. Um, to, but the key thing for your child here, Todd, is going to be those internships, um, because if they don't know what they're going to do, like it's important for them to put themselves in a position to observe the career firsthand. Even yeah. if it's an unpaid internship. And now if that's possible, not everybody can do an unpaid internship. Right. And I'm really, I philosophically have an issue with people offering unpaid internships. I think people should be paid for their time period. But 
in certain industries, that's just not an option. And so, yes, I think I think going to a community college is a great option given the situation you just described. My yeah. life mentor chips in management and assessment risk, risk. Awesome and brilliant. I'm telling you, Hifa, I surround <laughs> myself with very smart women. <laughs> okay, being the first is great, but I always ask him. I ask myself, now what? The one thing that bugs me with first generation students is that they feel like the race is over at high school or college graduation. No, mm -hmm. we need to keep moving forward. I am my parents' dream in the flesh. Aww. I love that. It's That's true. What, yeah. No, college degrees definitely are not the finish line. Oh my God. That just, it's like my husband says, that's just a pass to get in the ring and fight. <laughs> That, that just allows you to get in the ring and fight. Now, now you got to fight for what you really want in life. Absolutely. And, and it doesn't, you don't finish with college. That's when it gets harder. Because in college, you've pretended to be an adult. And everyone at the internship loved you. And they told you they were going to give you a job. And guess what? They're not going to give you that reporter job you wanted because you're the last, you're at the bottom of the list because you just graduated. So you got to start. From zero. If you were hot deal in college, you're not. You're back at the bottom of the line. And you that's where the connections from those internships become so important. Absolutely. And you know, and there's so many things about this generation that I absolutely love. Me too. But one of the things that can be double side, it's a double-edged sword, sword is their sense of urgency and impatience, right? To ah, get the yo tenía prisa pa todo, nena. Yo tenía prisa pa todo. No, I know, but like, I feel like this particular, like I had, <laughs> when I was the executive director of City Year, I had one of my young people, 23 years old, come up to me and say, how can I get to be the executive director of a nonprofit in two years? Oh, I, You know what my response was, Anna? You know what I told her? I said, mm. Mamita, I don't know, but as soon as you figure it out, you let me know, please, because it took me years to get to this point you know and um and sometimes just the, the aspect of having time and learning by doing and you know th there's value in that you know i have to say and i don't know if you see this in your kids my husband saw it in some of his younger employees when he was in advertising mm -hmm. and they would tell him this this is not moving quick enough when am i getting a promotion when am i getting a raise and steve would say you've only been here a year or you've only been here six months. What? Where is it that you want to go? I mean, I understand and admire your chutzpah and your self-esteem. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're like, do you think maybe I could get a raise? I don't know. Perhaps if you think like at age 40, I'm still hemming and hawing in my contract negotiations. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry, sir. I'm not worthy. And these <laughs> kids are like, when am I getting a promotion? And right. I see it in... I see it in my 13 year old now who's like, I'm late for my career. You my, know, so part of career. Again, <laughs> again, this is where I feel it's a double edged sword. Like mm -hmm. it can serve you in so many ways, but in others, it can come across to your employer as entitlement. And that's right. not a good thing. You no. do not want to be on your boss's radar as coming across mm -hmm. as entitled. Because, you know, I'm, this is one thing I always say to my mentees. Your talent is going to make room for you. Like, stop. Like, just, it's going to open doors. It's going to make room for you in your career. And so just keep on working hard, being excellent at what you do, and you will get noticed. And, oh, no matter your accent, your background, your hair, your looks, you'll get noticed. You may have to work <laughs> three times harder, but right. you'll get noticed and you have to, you have to be savvy about those connections and you'll be have, you have to be savvy about the way you go about, um, everything in life. That's right. No, absolutely. Right. Rebecca, this has been one of the most interesting conversations I've had in a while. I've learned so much. I am Ooh, so yeah. happy. I'm when are so we happy. Cook again? I want to cook again with you. Okay. Yeah. But you got to come up with this. Now we're back. <laughs> Nena, did you see my disaster with the flung? Uh, we, <laughs> when it like it turned into no, it. I, <laughs> you use the uh, cheesecake uh, former thingy. What would you call those? The hey, form hey, I was like my friend Giselle Blondet, who used to be in soap operas in Puerto Rico, used to say, "Yo nací princesa, pero no se lo dijeron a nadie." <laughs> I was born a princess, but the world was not informed. I'm not oh. supposed to be making flan. 
Someone's supposed to be making me the flan. Well, let me ask you something. Did it yes. taste good? Amazing. The flavor was great. Eso lo que vale. Eso lo que but vale. there was this much flan because it seeped through that darn thing. <laughs> You can find, she taught me how to make arroz con gandules. She's taught me how to make um, pastelón. <laughs> and you don't know all the phone calls and the texts I send this woman. Okay, I'm trying to make habichuelas. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Can I FaceTime you? And she's like, you know, being all CEO and board, member of a board <laughs> in serious conversation. And on the other side, let me see it. Okay, no, that's good. Oh my God. Really? Well, I think, you know, it's funny because. I love to celebrate the fact that Latina women like us, we can bring home the bacon and we can also fry it up in a pan. And this is not like, not all women are like that. Like I'm just, you know, like some of them either could do one or the other, but to marry the both, like that's pretty cool. And you Javier, know, but if you like it, because you know, I don't want it to be expected. No, espérate. I don't want it to be expected. A ti te gusta. No, it relaxes you. I'm not saying it's an expectation, but I'm just saying it's kind of cool when it happens. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's pretty cool. So. So where can people find you? Where can people contact you or follow you? Well, on Facebook, Instagram, and on TikTok, I'm at Rebecca Huffman with one C because, you know, that's how we speak. But así como está en the thingy right here, <laughs> the lower third. And on YouTube, I'm at Rebecca Nieves Huffman. Rebecca Huffman is for Instagram, Facebook, that kind of thing, right? TikTok, yep. Entonces, her TikToks are hilarious. They're so much um, fun. I thought, you know, it was just for like young kids, but you know, now my, my teenager has, has friends of hers that follow me on TikTok and she's absolutely mortified. No. And I'm sure I, then this is YouTube, right? Rebecca. Thank you. My friend, yes. what are you cooking tonight? Oh, you know what? Oh. Solomon went to a culinary camp at, at a, at a, at a all boys high school down here in the South side. Uh -huh. so we learned how to make pizza dough and pizza from scratch. So he begged me, mommy, can I make pizza tonight? And I said, oh, a day off in the kitchen? Yes, go for it. Dale. <laughs> go for it. So we're having pizza. <laughs> Good. Let me know how it tastes. Thank you so much. Love, love you, my friend. Te quiero un montón. Yo a ti, mi amor. Gracias. Thank you for everything. You know, I love when I find women that uh, are the first, but like Kamala Harris says, don't want to be the only, right? That's the whole point. And I hope that this conversation has helped you at whatever point in your life you are, because I think the tips were wonderful and applicable to so many aspects of our life and, you know, any decade of, of our life span. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, Mary, you're making cacho pepe. Tu si eres bien fina, my Mary. Huh? Oh, I don't know if you missed it, but I, I added to the juice you recommended some vodka and it was great. Ricky Martin is coming to town. I'm going to work on that. And yes, I made flan. Go check it out on YouTube. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook, Ana Belaval. And, um, and have a wonderful, wonderful week, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Wednesday Wine. Bye-bye.